Hi, my name is Bobby Barron, and I'm a senior research dietitian in the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research at Johns Hopkins, um, where I work with investigators on developing and carrying out the nutrition component of research protocols. I'm also one of the dietitians in the Adult Epilepsy Diet Center at Johns Hopkins. Here are my disclosures. I'm going to discuss the types of diet intervention trials, the various types of ketogenic diets, and how we can increase compliance and optimize the quality of data in intervention trials using the ketogenic diet. Diet counseling studies and diet feeding studies are two types of diet intervention trials. Intervention diets with or without controlled diets can be used in diet counseling studies. Um, the diet and teaching protocol are very clearly defined. Um, typically, the patients in the control arm are given the same amount of attention, like visits and follow-up, um, as in the intervention arm. Uh, this type of study has the potential for longer treatment periods and larger sample sizes. Food records may be used as a self-monitoring tool to ensure the patient is following the intended diet um, and can be used to assess actual intake. Um, the records must be reviewed by the dietitian and the participant together to ensure that uh, the record has enough details and amounts so that it can be analyzed for quantitative data. Um, in a feeding study, all food and drinks are prepared, weighed, and served or packed out uh, from large, future, uh, large research kitchens. Um, this is extremely labor intensive for the dietitians to plan and for the kitchen staff to make and can be fairly expensive. Compared to diet counseling studies, there are shorter, uh, they're typically shorter and have fewer patients. Um, this is the most rigorous type of study, but it may not need to be randomized or controlled um, depending on the study aims. Um, now I'm going to quickly review the types of ketogenic diet therapy and how we currently measure compliance. The classic ketogenic diet is calculated for each patient using a four to one ratio of four fat grams to one gram of carb and protein. Um, it's typically started inpatient, but outpatient starts are increasingly common. Um, and telemedicine starts have been used since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the four diet variations help meet challenges of implementing the strict classic ketogenic diet. Um, for the sake of time, I'll point out a few differences among the diets. Um, the term modified ketogenic diet is a newer term, and it can be used to describe lower ratio classic ketogenic diets um, or uh, a diet that guides the patient towards a certain gram goal of fat, carbs, or protein. Um, and this allows them to have more food choices. Um, this is similar to the modified Atkins diet where the instruction to patients is to eat no more than 20 grams of net carbs per day for adults and about 10 to 15 grams of net carbs per day for um, children and adolescents. Um, MCT oil has an increased potential um, to make ketones. And this is the premise of the MCT diet. Um, and, um, and in this case, the oil can make up approximately 30 to 60% of the calories. Uh, MCT oil can also be added to any ketogenic diet to boost ketones, um, and it can alleviate or prevent constipation. The goal of the low glycemic index treatment um, is to stabilize glucose by limiting carbohydrates and eating only those that digest more slowly. The low glycemic index treatment and the modified Atkins diet are almost exclusively started outpatient um, after a teaching session. I want to stress that in the first three diets, um, each food is weighed for each meal um, and has the same ketogenic ratio um, for each meal, day in and day out. So there's little variation or fluctuation in what um, the, the patient's actually eating in terms of their macronutrient composition. Um, modified Atkins diet and low glycemic index treatment allow more flexibility in food choices and amounts, um, making it challenging to assess their actual um, intake without some sort of compliance measure. Um, typically in ketogenic diet studies, compliance is self-reported. However, the only way to know um, the specific macronutrient and micronutrient um, intake is to conduct a thorough diet assessment. Um, at a clinic visit or through a surprise um, phone call, we can ask for a detailed account of what the patient ate yesterday. That's called a 24-hour recall. Um, we can also collect food records. Um, again, food records must be reviewed by the dietitian and the patient to collect all the information necessary to analyze it for quantitative um, data. 
the gold standard in analyzing diets is um, NDSR, Nutri Nutri Nutrition Data System for Research, and most large universities and research centers use it. Biomarkers of compliance um, can include urine and blood ketones that are checked at home, um, in clinic, or in the lab, and at a variety of time points in the study and on the diet. There are pros and cons of each method, so a combination of the two measures may be helpful. It's well known that adults have poor compliance on ketogenic diet therapies, um, despite the more liberal versions. Um, only about half of adults, um, only about, oops, sorry, um, only about half of adults uh, patients starting a ketogenic diet will still be on it at six months, and difficulty with compliance is cited as the main reason for stopping. Um, so next, I'll discuss a variety of thoughts on how to increase compliance in our diet patients so that we can maintain them on the diet long enough to assess efficacy. Um, feeding studies control intake, but 100% compliance is not guaranteed. Um, keto meal delivery services can decrease the patient's burden of planning and preparing meals. Um, adding a ready-to-drink um, keto formula that we use to tube-fed patients or even um, giving robust starter kits that include equipment, food, and coupons can help. The Children's Hospital Philadelphia um, has a keto teaching kitchen, which has been shown to increase confidence in parents' food preparation skills. In a research trial, it's imperative that patients understand the importance of staying on the diet regardless of their seizure control to prevent dropout. Uh, patients who use a feeding tube for the majority or sole source of their nutrition tend to be extremely compliant. Um, so that's an ideal population for trials of a classic ketogenic diet at any ratio. These types um, these diets are typically more expensive and can be difficult to learn, so they may inadvent inadvertently exclude patients of lower socioeconomic status. In one of the ketogenic trials I'm working on, um, our patients can receive gift cards uh, for reporting ketone values and even if they reach a certain level of ketosis on random days. Um, in diet counseling, studies, the dietitian's role in the study will be to educate, um, see the patient at established intervals, re-educate as needed, and to assess um, the diet at predetermined time points using recalls or food records and give feedback and encouragement. If compliance is a study outcome, in incorporate the completion of a baseline three-day food record as part of the inclusion criteria. This ensures that the participant and the family can follow the study procedures. Dietitians commonly use multiple interventions and modalities when working with patients, and this can be incorporated into a research trial as well. In sum, um, diets are clearly defined in diet counseling studies, but actual intake may vary, requiring assessment and reported implications. Um, on the other hand, actual intake controlled in feeding studies, improving study rigor. Strategies to increase compliance will improve study quality. Thank you.